If you've spent any amount of time in the internet recently, you might have seen this cute little smudge right here floating over a US military base. But I say let's take it and turn it into a 3D printed weaponized tabletop gaming miniature. For this project, I kind of set a goal of seeing how fast I can design a FFF compatible 3D printable miniature using as minimal supports as possible. So what I'm doing right here from the very beginning, when I got a very fast project in mind, I am literally scribbling down some basic ideas as to what I want to do. Normally I have a little bit more in-depth, slower, detailed design process, but I'm not doing that today. I'm going as fast as possible. So all I'm really trying to do with the scribbles here is take the kind of nebulous idea in my head and turn it into something concrete. And then when I'm done with that process, I start doing approximate line work. I know of this particular character here, there's some talk about comparing him to a overlord from Starcraft, but based on what I'm seeing in the video, as well as what Jeremy describes in his podcast, it's probably closer to the vision of the Star Wars probe droid. So I'm going in that direction. And that's why I'm doing the approximate line work to get more of a mechanical miniature. And I go through a few revisions of this line work, just trying to figure out what I think the actual details would be, what some of the more interesting aspects of the miniature would be. And I am also referencing other things I've designed before. Clearly this jellyfish UFO thing has some sort of anti-gravitational technology. So I'm borrowing some aspects from another miniature created featuring anti-grav technology and incorporating it into this design. So this vehicle right here is that reference I'm referring to. And this is the Griffin hover tank from my Coordinator Alliance line of miniatures. More on that in just a minute. Now with the approximate line work done, I'm going to move on to a more formalized and kind of set line work. Up to this point, I've been using entirely a Wacom tablet to do all my drawing for my design process, but now I'm switching over to using my mouse and keyboard to get a much more precise layout for my final design piece. The reason why I'm doing this step now is when I jump into Blender here in a little bit, instead of kind of filling around in Blender trying to get the shapes that I want, all I gotta do is drag vertices and drop them in the right spot, and it's gonna make the 3D modeling process go a lot faster. With my front and side view design done, now I've only really done the formalized design on the side, not the front, but that's all right. I kind of know in my head what the front's going to look like. We're going to jump over to here to Blender in just a moment. But before we get to there, I want to show off these little guys right here. These are two of the three miniatures that I just mentioned from my Coordinator Alliance gaming miniature set. They're a series of 3D printable gaming miniatures designed to work on FFF slash FDM printers with minimal amounts of support. And they're now available for sale. They were a Kickstarter early in the year, but now they're available independently for sale. They're on my Etsy store, but if you head over to fracturedcolony.com, that'll redirect you to the right place. And that URL, fracturedcolony.com, is down in the description below. All right, let's head over to Blender and start working on our little alien probe thing right here. I'm gonna talk about a few of the tricks that I used to create this miniature instead of doing a step-by-step -step walkthrough of how to actually create it from the ground up. The first thing I do is I start bringing in some of these formalized designs I had from Photoshop, bring them in the blender, and I'm gonna build my miniature on top of them. One quick little trick here you wanna do is take each of these images and move them down on the Z axis a little bit because it puts them at basically the middle of the world. So if you drop them down a little bit along the z-axis, it'll get them out of the way of your actual model that you're building on top of them. And one of the big advantages of doing that formalized design inside of Photoshop first is you know how many corners each piece of your little mechanical vehicle are going to require. Because one of the tricks, if you want to go and add in like a really large numbered vertice object inside Blender, you create a cylinder and set that number of vertices to whatever number of vertices that you need. So a cylinder doesn't necessarily have to be just a cylinder, like a hexagon is an approximate shape of a cylinder. So for most of the pieces on this little alien scout probe, jellyfish, UFO, whatever you want to call it thing, I know how many vertices that piece requires. So I'm going to pay, add in a cylinder with that many vertices and then spread them out to each of the corners before I start building up the 3D basic shape. And you can create a lot of simple, fast detail 
doing this by layering on a few shapes like this. And then I'm also working a lot with the bevel tool to give the front edge of all the pieces a bevel. It's another way of getting cheap, easy to cool looking design aspects in detail added to your miniature without a whole lot of work. Besides those two things, I'm doing a little bit of Boolean work. That's mathematical operations. Usually I use this to create subtraction where I basically use one object and use it to rip a chunk out of another object. This is how you create impressions or any sort of inset areas in your miniature. How I did some of the details around the knee, what I'm calling the quote knee joint. When it comes to the approach of design of a miniature that's designed for limited amounts of support, you essentially need to flat pack your miniature for lack of a better phrase, where you take each of the pieces and align them as much as possible on the printer bed, which is gonna mean there's gonna be some more assembly on the user side, but then all the pieces are gonna look better. It's a bit of a trade-off. And I'm doing that here. With the main leg section, for example, I've got my upper leg and I got some detail on top of it. And there is a little bit of an overhang here. It's gonna require a small amount of support, but not much. But there's also detail on the inside of the leg that I'm building out. And that's gonna end up being a separate 3D printed piece that are then gonna to need to be glued together later on when the person goes ahead to assemble their miniature model. One thing that is helpful when you're aligning objects in Blender that are next to each other, you can do what's known as the, basically the scale zero trick, is what I call it. I've probably got a more proper name. But you select vertices that are all supposed to be aligned along a certain axis, like say the Z axis or something. You select them all, press S for scale, press the axis you want to align them on, like Z, and then press the number zero, and that will align them all perfectly together. Uh, what this is for is if you have a piece, for example, in the leg section that might be made of multiple pieces, it's going to let you align all the bottom vertices, if, even the different objects, to be on the same plane. So having a nice flat bottom, all your pieces by using this trick is a great way to ensure that slicers are happy. And before we get to the final sizing of this miniature, there is one more important operation that's helpful to know about, and it's also helpful for improving the bevel results. So if you're playing around with the bevel tool and it seems like weird things are kind of happening, there is a concept in Blender called apply scale. It's a behind the scenes mathematical aspect of the program where you press control A, a little menu will pop up, choose scale, and all you're really doing is taking some mathematical operations and setting everything to one. I don't quite get it, but it's what it happens. What you'll notice is when you do this, in your little properties window on the right hand side of your screen, press N if you don't see it, you'll see the scale values for X, Y, and Z change from random values based on however you model the piece up, all to one. And this essentially resets a lot of mathematical operations in Blender and it will make bevel correctly. And also then, once you've got your entire piece modeled out and you need to go ahead and scale the final piece up to whatever size it needs to be, you want to apply scale to all the pieces individually, and therefore you're gonna reset them all to the same scale level, then pick one of your pieces, in this case I chose my upper leg portion, and I scaled that to the right size that I wanted, I looked at what my scale values were for my scale X, Y, and Z. I changed them to something really close that's rememberable. So instead of 9.693273831216342285, I changed the 9.7. And then I copied that scale value to all of my objects. And then therefore that's gonna get me a precise upscaling of all the pieces to the right size without having to use the you know, the mouse scale operation and get things approximate. It gets a perfect, precise, accurate, using both words incorrectly, solution for your miniatures when you want to go from whatever your design scale was to your final miniature scale. So export them all as STL files and let's go ahead and print them out. With the magic of video editing, all the 3D printing is now done. So let's go ahead and assemble this miniature. And I'm gonna be using some Loctite brand super glue after the debacle that was Gorilla Glue last time around. I don't know what happened. I think the bottle was terrible, but I don't know. So I bought a different brand. <laughs> go see where I did the Warhammer terrain build out of foam core board if you wanna know what I'm talking about. As I'm assembling my little miniature here, I thought it'd be fun just to talk a little bit about the video itself, what my thoughts are on the video, and how one could possibly actually authenticate such a video. So when it comes to like some unknown video content, like what we saw with the Jellyfish UFO, the burden of proof, obviously in this case, lies with Jeremy 
and it's his job to prove that a this video actually shows some sort of unknown craft it's not a situation where the default state is the video shows an unknown craft and it's up to everybody else to debunk it while that is the right approach to take, it is a difficult one for him to actually go ahead and figure out. I listened to the entire Weaponized podcast where he discussed this video and also he had the interview with the Marine on that episode. I'll, I'll put a link to it down in the show notes, I think, if I remember to do it. I'm curious to see what he had to say about the video. And as much as it's fun to kind of make fun of the whole bird poop joke that people were trying to debunk the video with, the real issue is that how do you differentiate this video from just, let's say, visual effects or some sort of CGI video. And now, while it's possible to debunk a visual effects video somewhat easily, I imagine right now the internet is probably scouring every single stock footage site out there trying to find if any of the assets that show up in this video are available in the stock video site. If any of them are, it's a pretty good, if not 100% indication that this video is a forgery in some way or another. Because at the end of the day, like I said, you can debunk a visual effects video such as that. Or, for example, maybe they figure out this background video. It is an actual U.S. military installation, but it's not the one where the event supposedly took place. Or maybe it's just some really well done actor setup that somebody created where they hired a few people to look like soldiers, walked in the background, and they filmed a drone shot with what looks to be kind of a pseudo-military style installation video. Because at the end of the day, there really isn't a way to distinguish a perfect CGI rendering of a video from an actual real event, like something you see here. Adding to the difficulty that Jeremy would have to prove this video is real is the fact that it is thermal imaging. Now, th thermal imaging is a great way to do what you call hide your crimes when it comes to visual effects. If you could do anything that makes a particular scene more grainy and more difficult to tell what's going on, it's a great way to hide all sorts of issues and in minor inaccuracies about a visual effects rendering. And then with the thermal imaging shot, it's naturally a very grainy, very low resolution shot and therefore it makes it a little bit easier to hide visual effects because of the low quality of the video. Now also, due to the nature of how thermal imaging works, some of the most difficult aspects of visual effects, such as texturing, getting the lighting correct, light reflections, all that kind of really cool physics stuff, goes out the window. So it technically is an easier type of visual effects to fake than if it were an optical or standard, you know, standard video. <laughs> so with those disclaimers out of the way, what are my concerns with this particular video and how Jeremy went ahead and basically made his case for why this video is actually indeed some sort of little UFO thing flying over a military base. So first and foremost, we can go through some of the things. Jeremy admits that he's not using, hmm, that piece is broken. Oh well. I wonder what happened to it. <laughs> now I just realized a little piece of the miniature is broken. That's alright. Anyway, it should look like that. Now, one of the things that Jeremy admits to doing in throughout his discussion on his podcast is he doesn't use military terminology quite correct. Now, the U.S. military has a certain way of doing things. They have a very particular language and order of operations of how everything is done. Now, just because someone uses or does not use the correct terminology when it comes to how the U.S. military operates does not validate or invalidate a video's claims what it tends to show is a somewhat lack of due diligence on the person's part releasing the video. Do they do the actual research to see how the military operates and to see if the story he's being told around this particular video lines up with how the U.S. military should actually operate. And therefore that also if he were to be able to verify some of the proper military terminology that a person was given to him about the details around this video, he could kind of compare that to with no one proper military terminology to see whether this person actually knew what they were talking about. Second then, related to that, on the topic of thermal imaging, he admitted to not being a thermal imaging expert, which is fine, but there's no reason that a lot of the 
ideas of how the thermal imaging is supposed to work in this video should be sorted out. Thermal imaging is not a magical technology. It's something that's fairly accessible. Now there's an argument to be made that maybe the military has some really fancy thermal imaging that is not available in the civilian market, but this is the United States of America where our civilians are almost, in a lot of some ways, more well equipped than 98% of the world's military forces. And thermal imaging is one of those things. You can actually go to a sporting goods store and buy thermal imaging binoculars, rifle scopes, and all sorts of fun things starting at around maybe a thousand fifteen hundred dollars so it w shouldn't be hard to find somebody who can really explain what's going on thermally with this video that we're looking at here now once again not understanding how the thermal optics work does not invalidate the video but it doesn't show due diligence on the researchers part of trying to validate what he's looking at then we get to the whole story of this marine that he interviewed who reported he served at this military base. The Marine essentially stated that he had witnessed or had watched this video on the base and said that this story, this jellyfish UFO, was some sort of ghost story that was popular among the soldiers of the base, which that's entirely possible that maybe there was a quote, ghost story for lack of a better phrase, about this jellyfish thing that floated through the base. That doesn't mean that this video here necessarily shows that incident that triggered all those stories. Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. That's what we're trying to prove. Now, there did seem to be a few points in the Marines interview where they didn't quite line up with whatever Jeremy's original source was. Um, in particular, the one that really stood out was that Jeremy's source stated that right after the video was captured, the base commander came with a pair of Marines to confiscate the CD that had the video on it and the video was taken immediately away from the base never to be seen again. At least that's how I interpret the situation. The Marine said that he had seen the video serving on the base approximately several months after the incident occurred, which would imply that the video was either not completely taken from the base and maybe just a copy was removed but see there's a little bit of an inconsistency there also jeremy's original source said that everybody was forced to sign an nda however it seemed to imply the marine the marines interview that he was talking to other people about this video he didn't really admit it, but it sounded like he was plus this whole ghost story thing about the jellyfish ufo would seem to imply that people talked to other people already about the video so if there was some sort of nda signing to keep this video secret it clearly didn't do a whole lot to stop the soldiers in the base from talking to each other another little inconsistency that it doesn't once again these things don't prove or disprove the video they're just kind of odd there are things that you really someone should really work out to figure out what is the truth behind what is going on here and at the time that I'm recording this here, the official statement of the Department of Defense, because they did, I guess, kind of release a statement, was no comment. That's not really a statement, but they actually responded to inquiries from, I believe it is News, News Nation. Um, and that was their response, was no comment. And the reason why, obviously, the U.S. military wouldn't comment, not just because of the fact that there's a UFO situation going on, even if this is a case where it's entirely a fake video, there is a non-zero chance that somebody decided to use actual U.S. military surveillance video of one of their bases as a background for a visual effects shot. I don't know why you do that. That's a really dumb thing to do. But just by virtue of using that, there is potentially sensitive information how these forward operating bases or whatever the military calls them once again i'm not using the right terminology because i'm not trying to prove a video but inherently you may be able to learn about how the u.s military operates and defends these bases patrols them things like that in response to watching whatever that surveillance video is in the background there and the u.s military would not want to confirm if that piece of video is actually real even if the little cute little alien thing floating through the base is just someone's about three hour job in blender <laughs> so the last two questions you probably have at this point well maybe three one is who the hell i am i'm jason the creator of the tabletop battlefield question number two is probably what scale are these miniatures i designed them to be a 32 millimeter scale in case that matters 
feel free to do what you want to do with the STL files. And that brings me to the last question, which is where can you get these files? Head over to tabletopbattlefield.com forward slash jellyfish, and I'll have them for available for download there for free. So thank you guys all for watching. If you want to see me do more weird and crazy crypto things like this, check out this video over here where I modeled up my version of the Mongolian death worm. This is another little 3D modeling tutorial for resin printers this time though. All right, I'll see you guys all next time.